Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And today we are thrilled to welcome an extremely versatile talent, the legendary weatherman who spent nearly four decades on KNBC in Los Angeles and currently is the co-host of Media Path Podcast, along with Louise Palenker. Please help us welcome Fritz Coleman. Fritz, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, guys, I'm excited to be with you. You do a great job. Oh, we, we appreciate that, <laughs> especially coming from you. <laughs> well, like I mentioned at the top, you've had such a great career, which is still growing strong. But let's start at the beginning. You you grew up in Pennsylvania. Can you tell us a little bit about what your home life was like? Sure. I grew up in, uh, <clears throat> in suburban Philadelphia, mm -hmm. classic, uh, ultra-Caucasian suburban neighborhood. <laughs> uh, but I had a spectacular... Uh, childhood, very safe, great post-World War II boomer environment. It was all I asked for, uh, but I was an only child, so uh, I entertained myself and then went on to make a career out of entertainment, but it was good. I, uh, I went to Salem College in Clarksburg, West Virginia, out of high school. Salem College was a bastion for underachievers people that had marginal grades. And so I was lucky to get in there. Mm -hmm. I went to Salem for two years. This was <clears throat> during the uh, middle throes of the Vietnam War oh, well. and the draft mm -hmm. was still in existence. And in order to maintain your deferment from getting drafted, you had to maintain a C average uh, in college. Well, I fell through that uh, safety net and uh, <laughs> got, a, got an, uh, a request from the Defense Department to come and get a physical. Oh, and when I saw that was coming, I, 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 I was happy to um, I was happy to defend my country, but I thought I could do it in a non gun oriented way. So I went enlisted in the Navy for four years. Hmm. where I worked for Armed Forces Radio and Television. It gave me oh, my wow. career in broadcasting. And, and then I went back to college and was off and running. That was a really long answer, but I couldn't help myself. Oh, that's so, great. Good grief. That's <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. was, your, was your family into performing at all? Not at all. My father was a salesman. <laughs> And my father and a BS artist, and that was a that was a type of performer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. he he was uh, he was the sales manager for an international um, uh, construction materials company. They oh. sold things like stone and cement and slag. And you have to be really good to be enthusiastic selling slag across the table. Oh and my gosh. he was good. So I learned my, uh, I learned my, I think I learned my uh, chops from him. <laughs> well, you talked about entertaining yourself because you were an only child, but when did you start wanting to perform as a possible career? Well, I, I think uh, in, in my, I, I mean, I was always in the plays and stuff at school. Mm -hmm. I, I had the classic uh, dysfunction of, needing an excess amount of attention. I think that came from being an only child. So I got in plays and things. And then the first time I went to college at Salem, I was in a thing called Reader's Theater where uh, they would get a cast of a play and rather than memorize everything, uh, the cast would be on the stage and read the script and uh, oh. sort of create this uh, theater of the mind experience without having sets and movement and all that. You just did everything with your voice. And we got a state championship in that. And I was sort of hooked on doing the performing thing. And then uh, I did Armed Forces Radio and Television. I got out of the Navy. I was in the radio business for 15 years. I was a DJ, mm -hmm. a talk show host, all those things. And then when I was a DJ uh, in Buffalo, New York, 
Uh, those are the days when disc jockeys would get jobs hosting at nightclubs around town. It was a big deal, either playing records or just hosting. Right. And I got, I got a job hosting in a jazz club. And uh, jazz clubs are a very uh, kind of a surreal environment. Even though it says the show starts at eight o'clock, in a jazz club, the show doesn't start till the jazz players are feeling the vibe. So it might be 820, it might be 825. But the owner of the club has charged a very um, expensive two drink minimum and he wants to start the show at eight o'clock. So purely as a defense mechanism, I began to write material for myself to fill the time from eight o'clock to when the band decided to show up out of their trailer and put the bong down and come, you know, and do the show. <laughs> and, and so I got involved in stand up and then I developed a little following. And then the younger of the jazz club gave me my own night on Monday night to have, wow. a, uh, have, a, have a comedy night. And I became enamored with that and decided to move to LA and try comedy as a career in 1980. In those days, you had to come out and work at the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, so that, that's how my career started. And then I was uh, performing at the comedy store in Los Angeles and the news director from channel four was in the audience with his wife. And after the show came and introduced himself. And I talked about having done the weather in the Navy against my will and not knowing anything about it. <laughs> and he said, how would you like to come and do some vacation relief work at channel four? And I was making $45 a night at the comedy store. I said, oh my God, when do you want me to start? <laughs> So I auditioned. I got the job. I did utility for two years. Th this story's almost over. And then my <laughs> that's okay. My, my predecessor left, and I was bumped up to the weekday weather job. And I retired two weeks shy of forty years at NBC right. in Burbank. Wow. Oh that's my god! My, of my career. My now, god. You know, questions about because i've given you the whole story <laughs> oh, that's all right we can we can dig right back in <laughs> yes absolutely well, i want to know just just curious you know you mentioned all these things that you know you started who were some of your favorite performers as a kid well um when i was too early to think about it as a career mm -hmm. johnny carson was always a hero of mine mm. and i think he he sort of had the same personal power that my father had and that was he could draw focus in a room he 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 could make people feel warm and he was funny and he was off the cuff and i just thought that was wonderful and then when i was a senior in high school somebody bought me tickets to see george carlin mm -hmm. and uh where i lived in philly they used to have these summer music fairs. This one was called the Valley Forge Music Fair, which was a, a, a tent that held 3000 people. It was a beautiful venue with a rotating stage and they had them every summer. And I went to see George Carlin. And I, I not knowing anything about stand up except what I'd seen on the Ed Sullivan show and the Johnny Carson show was it was honestly without exaggerating a religious experience. This guy stood on the stage and for 90 minutes with no notes, seemingly right off the top of his head convulsed this audience and i thought wow mm. it's the greatest amount of power any person can have over another human being except mm. maybe a tv evangelist but george didn't ask for money <laughs> at the end of the show yeah and so that that those two i think carson and george Carlin, and then robert klein was always a favorite of mine oh great and, bob, yeah. and all the regulars oh, bob hopes my yeah. my all-time favorite I, yeah. I, Absolutely. No one had better timing. No one did anything yep. to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned you mentioned DJing before. So I just want to, you know, how, how did you start going into that? How did you start getting that as, as a career? And and I also want to know what a curiosity, what was the format of the station when you first started? Well, I started when I was in the Navy. When I worked for Armed Forces Radio and Television, I was in a ship for three right. and a half years. I was on the USS John F. Kennedy, and we did two 10-month cruises to Europe. And while we were on the ship, people that worked in public affairs for Armed Forces Radio and Television had to do radio shows. I did a radio show from 6 to 10 in the morning. I did the evening newscast. I did not only anchored the news, but I did the weather forecast. Then after that was all done, I showed these 16 millimeter kinescopes of movies to the rest of the ship. So I had all this experience. 
No, do they As, ask I, you, do you want to go into this? Or this is something that you say, oh, I want no, to- they asked me, they asked me, this, the ship was brand new and they were looking for people to outfit this onboard oh, broadcasting okay. facility. And I said, boom, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know if I could do it. I, I had no, I hadn't even thought about it. And I thought that sounds really cool. So <laughs> I, I did it. And then when I was wrapping up my, uh, my tour in the Navy, I started making tapes for myself and sending them out. And I got a nibble at a radio station, WIFI, Wi-Fi 92 in Philadelphia. And I got, I got a job and I literally was wow. not out of work one day. The day wow. after I got out of the Navy, I went and, and got this job and I worked there. And then I went to Syracuse and Buffalo, New York. And then I started my comedy career. But it, to answer your question, it was top 40. It was all CHR, contemporary hit radio, top 30, billboard research those things and so you know, you talking the, playing records talking playing records all the time. oh yeah 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 talking up the vocals of records and and you yeah. know a hot clock where you come out with a fast record at the top of the hour and you never play two ballads back to back and you never <laughs> pull two females back to back all that crap <laughs> Which they don't do anymore. anyway <laughs> so so then you th then you move into stand-up what was your early act like well i've always been i mean i mean I, if you had to ask if I have a hook, I don't really have a hook. I just do observational material. I don't mm. do uh, current events jokes for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are too many good people doing it now. You know, Bill Maher is great in The Daily Show and Jon Stewart were great and Stephen Colbert are great. Nobody's ever going to do topical material better than them. And selfishly, I avoid it because the shelf life of political materials very short. You just have to keep writing. So I just write observational stuff. Uh, I, I, I sort of uh, invented a, a new format, which is a single topic monologue. And I call them a one person show. And I've done four of them. I did one about being a parent called It's Me Dad. I did one about divorce called The Reception. I did one about the news called Tonight at 11. I did one about getting old called Defying Gravity. And I just finished one and I'm taking a special for it on October 16th oh, nice. at a theater in North Hollywood called Unassisted Living, where I talk about getting old and surviving the pandemic and having grandchildren and all those things. So mm. uh, that's it. I, I'm an observational comic and uh, I like words. And I got mm. that from Carlin. I love wordplay and a metaphor and imagery and all that kind of stuff. Did you want to like, were you nervous at all? Like leaving behind something that you've started that you've been in for so long and like kind of started having success just to like go on out and try a new new venture, new city? It's, you sound like you wrote my father's argument. For, <laughs> for, 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 when I took, you know, I was making, I was making a great living being a, a disc jockey right. in Buffalo, New York. And I said, Dad, guess what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to LA. I'm going to be a comic. And he picked himself up off the ground. He said, why, why would you do that? You, you've worked so hard to get here. You're, why are you doing that? I just said, well, I have to try it. I have no responsibilities. I sold an insurance policy for $5,000. I had a brand new car. And I, I'd never been to LA and just drove out here. Oh. And I, I, I mean... All, the only thing I brought to the table was I wasn't afraid to try. And mm. that's it. But, so you but, didn't know anyone there? You just left on your own? own? Say that again? You didn't know anyone there? You just left? You just I, I knew a lady I had done commercials with okay. who let me stay on the floor of her apartment in a sleeping bag until I found my own apartment. <laughs> wow. That is and absolutely I had, I, I'll tell you the truth. I had maybe 10 minutes of good material when I moved out here. I thought, well, I've conquered Buffalo. I'm certainly ready for LA and the comedy <laughs> store. So I came out here. I'd never been to the comedy store before. And so the <laughs> first night I'm here, I dropped my sleeping bag off at Sherry's house, the lady where I stayed, went to the comedy store and just became a member of the audience. And that night on stage was Gary Shandling preparing for his oh, first wow. tonight show, Jimmy Walker, Billy <laughs> Crystal doing his you know, Muhammad Ali impression <laughs> and a brilliant, a brilliant comedian who really has gone uncelebrated, but might be as brilliant as Robin Williams was called Charles Fleischer. He did the oh, voice yeah. of Rabbit. Oh, yes. Anyway, so this was the show. Oh. And 
it just knocked the wind out of me. I said, I have made the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> I, am so, I am so unprepared to be playing in this pool. What have I done? Oh. I, I just I, I slinked to my car and drove mm -hmm. back to the lady's house. And I thought, well, I'll stay here till I run out of money. And then I'll go home and apologize to everybody for all the goodbye gifts and everything and try to reestablish <laughs> my life. But that was it. And I just started doing open mics. And I did open mics at the comedy store for two years. And then I was made what's called a paid regular where you get a number of spots each week and you're on the show every week. And then that's when the guy came and saw me and gave me my job at NBC. So oh I, I've had a series of amazing bits of luck in my life that I'm forever thankful for. Well, so this is one of the things that you know, I love getting to talk to people who came from anywhere else um, and then decided to risk everything and go to Los Angeles. Because, I mean, every big city is a bit of a culture shock, but L.A. is its own unique, you know, set of craziness. And, um, you know, I really Absolutely. admire that. So, OK, for me, because I lived half my life in Los Angeles, you were the weather caster on television that was for me for sure and i was always impressed wow. how you can make the weather funny i just i thought this is fantastic so yes you really helped me through <laughs> my, my weather issues in an amusing way so when wow. did you first start seeing your popularity there surge well i, I mean it just happens over time and mm. you know what we were if you remember uh me being there you remember fred rogan who was the sports guy oh yeah and they, and they did a very expensive uh, uh, series of commercials to promote us, and uh, I was the I was the beneficiary of lots of great advertising. And what happens with local news is that after you're there for a while, um, you become a part of people's life, and tele uh, uh, television news is one of the only areas of TV where you break the fourth wall. That is, you're looking right into the camera and you yeah. establish a type of intimacy with people. And when you come on at the same time every night, 518 if on the five o'clock news, 518 every night for 40 years, you become a part of the fabric of people's lives. And it's almost like they take comfort in, in you know, they know if Fritz shows up at 518, I must still be alive because the news is continuing. <laughs> and, and really, you, you, it's like, it's, it's an odd thing. It's like you're, you're a neighbor, you're a trusted neighbor or family member. In LA, you're not that high up the food chain because they have real stars in LA. So <laughs> the, the local <clears throat> news personalities are like just below dinner theater in the LA structure of, uh, of, uh, of uh, show business, but you, you, you become a part of people's lives and, and people begin to uh, take a proprietary interest in you. I'd go to the grocery store and some old lady would walk up to me and say, you know, I love you. I've been watching you for 30 years, but don't ever wear that tie you wore on Thursday. Again. It's very unflattering to your eye. And, you know, like, like your mom would do. And you don't get mad because they're just, they, they've taken you, they're, they're giving you a hug is what it amounts to. And it's interesting. But, that, but that's uh. how the popularity sort of grows over time. Well, they, they had started giving you, I mean, you became so popular, they started giving you your own shows. I mean, I was reading like, you know, It's Fritz and What a Week. Can you tell us about those, how those came about? Yeah, that was unbelievable. Um, uh, again, just, uh, I look back on it and I'm flabbergasted at all the good luck I had. We had a show that aired uh, after Saturday Night Live called It's Fritz, which was a local variety show. Now, when you have, a show that's local in LA, you can draw from the LA talent pool, like actors and comics. We gave Adam Sandler his first television appearance. Oh, wow. We had, we had uh, Jim Carrey. We had the Commodores. We had Bonnie Raitt. Uh, oh. Our band was made up of a, a, a group of players who were off the road. Our, our band leader was Lawrence Juber, who was the lead guitarist for Paul McCartney and Wings. We had the keyboardist from Bonnie Raitt's band. We had Bruce Gary, who was the drummer from The Knack, My Sharona. We had all these astonishing players who were based in L.A. And this was just like a hobby. It was like a hobby for them. And uh, we, we, we had sketches and we let comics perform. And I did a bit of a monologue. And we were really proud of the show. And A&E, back in the days when they were, uh, they 
bought David Letterman's rerun shows mm -hmm. from NBC when he was following Johnny Carson, came and shopped us and they were interested in running our show, but we didn't have enough episodes. We only had mm -hmm. 12 episodes a year and we had two years because it was too expensive to do. So they weren't interested. They needed to have like wow. 60 episodes a year. But yeah. it was it was it was amazing. What a week was kind of a it was kind of a, a uh, John Oliver type show where we looked at the week past and made our sort of snarky comments about what had happened. Hmm. And uh, that ran for about a year. But then it got too expensive to do local television, even though even though it's Fritz only cost 30 or forty thousand dollars a week. Uh, it, it, you know, they were coming, you know, Byron Allen was coming in and he was producing uh, live at the Apollo Theater saying, I'll give you the show for free as long as you run these Ford advertisements in it. And my boss said, I can't turn that down. It, it cost me huh. nothing. You know, so it was wow. money. The, the show hmm. was successful. We had ratings that were even higher than the news while we hmm. were on after Saturday Night Live, but we just couldn't sustain the economic model. But it was a huh. great experience for me. God, man, absolutely fascinating. So during your time reporting, what were some of the crazy stories that you remember or, or actually covered? Well, um, as a weather person, and really as a news person in general, you, you, the days when you really get your blood pumping is when you know that what you're doing is of value. For instance, in emergencies. LA has a lot of bad brush fires. LA mm. has El Nino floods. Whenever the news can offer a life-saving service, that's when you really feel like you're making a difference in people's lives. And you go on the air sometimes six, eight hours without the opportunity to go to the bathroom. I mean, you, you were out here. It's the continuous coverage, the breaking news coverage. And oh, you yeah. feel like you're making a difference in people's lives. I think the most meaningful experiences I had were in the old days, like pre-1992, uh, they would send our whole, NBC has owned the rights to the Olympics for years. They would send the whole news team to the Olympics. I mean, 150 people to go hmm. do our, new, our, our live broadcast from the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I got to go to Seoul, Korea, and then the one following that in Atlanta. And we were, in, I have one story about this that'll, give you goosebumps. Hmm. Uh, Atlanta, we did all the broadcasts from what's called Centennial Park. Mm -hmm. This was a circular park in the middle of downtown Atlanta with all the security because of, you know, obviously it's the Olympics. And in order for us to do live broadcasts, they had six what are called fiber optic drops. These were six locations within this circle where we could do live broadcasts anytime we wanted. So this one night, we were doing the news live back to LA from Atlanta. So the 11 o'clock news was actually two o'clock Atlanta time. We were doing the 11 o'clock news and I had been down just to the right of this performance stage where they had big stars come and perform at one of these fiber optic drops. I finished the weather forecast at about 11, about 2.20 in the morning. I'm walking back to the Quonset hut where the news team hung out between shows and that's when the Olympic Park bomb went off, wow. literally 15 feet from where I had just done the weather under a park oh bench. Wow. It was a backpack full of nails and dynamite and a lady died. Honestly, I, I missed being affected by that explosion by five minutes. Oh. And it was, you know, it was one of those things that happened so quickly that we didn't realize the danger we were in until like a day later. And we looked at the video of the whole place shaking when the oh, bomb wow. went. It was really scary. But what was fascinating about that was that we were scared. We're from the United States. We're not used to terrorism. But every other country, the 150 countries that are at the Olympics, went right back to normal activity. And I would say to these people, that, you know, parents who brought their kids over here from Norway or from North Africa, I'd say, did that not bother you? Did a bomb went off? And they said, bombs go off in our countries all the time. We had to sell our house to be able to bring our child to compete in the Olympics. Nothing's going to ruin this experience. It was really wow. an eye-opening eye experience. So anyway. Unreal. Wow. I think that's probably the most memorable. <clears throat> 
time. Uh, you, you, you mentioned before, I want to, which I have to ask about, you mentioned before, you know, you one of your influences and, you know, people that you admired was Johnny Carson. You actually got mm -hmm. to appear on The Tonight Show with him. With him. So mm -hmm. how surreal was that? How, and what was he like? I mean, I did Carson um, uh, eight times. Right. I, and part of the reason for that was um, our news office was right above the Tonight Show stage. Hmm. The Tonight Show stage was stage number one at NBC Studios at 3000 West Alameda, Burbank. And we were right upstairs. So if they ever had a fallout, what they call a fallout, where somebody canceled, he'd come and get me and say, do you have a new hip sticks you can come and do? And I said, hell yes. And so I'd go and do it. <laughs> but during the, during the Tonight Show in those days, you know, this is before comics got cable specials. Mm -hmm and uh all these other things during the tonight show I, I refer to it as your comedy bar mitzvah it, it's you becoming an adult as a comedian it's when my parents finally realized that i'd made a good decision about <laughs> giving up my high paying job in buffalo but it's uh it's um it's surreal you don't remember it until later it's a flash of light but i'll, t I'll tell you an interesting story about carson the first time I was booked to go on there, I got bumped off. If you remember the old Tonight Show, uh, if you look at the clock, uh, the, he would do his monologue and then he would do what's called a desk piece. And that la that was desk comedy. It lasted until like 10 minutes or 12. Then he would bring a headliner out, that mean the big star, and they would stay till about 10 after 12. And then you would put the comic on and then the music guest. Well, if the headliner went long, the comic always got bumped off. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I got bumped off twice. Uh, the first time I got bumped off was Charles Grodin, who was a great storyteller but wouldn't shut up. So he went long. <laughs> the second time, Heather Locklear. What? Now this is before I had my first appearance. I got bumped twice. The second time, Heather Locklear had just had some recent enhancement surgery, and Johnny was completely enamored with her. So that conversation <laughs> went on a little too long. Oh dear. And I finally made it on. So um, there is a point to the story. So <laughs> I, I made it on and, uh, you know, you don't sleep that night. And uh, and again, our, our office was right over The Tonight Show. And the next day after I did my first performance, I was walking over to the commissary across the NBC midway to the commissary, precisely when Johnny was coming to work. He came to work at the same time every day, two o'clock. Hmm. He would either be driving a Corvette or a DeLorean, and he'd have a white tennis outfit on every day. So I'm, I'm walking out of the building, and I noticed Johnny coming in, so I slowed down in order to force an encounter with him so I could stand <laughs> take great compliments from him, you know, about my performance. So I, I, I walk up to him. I walk past him. I, I was six inches from his shoulder. He never said hello. He never wow. said nice job i hope you can come back on the show he just walked past me with a frown on his face and it knocked the wind out of me i mm. thought oh my god my career is over in show business <laughs> so i went back upstairs and i called the talent coordinator that booked the comics jim mccauley and i said listen i hope you didn't take too much heat for my performance last night i don't think your boss was happy with how i did last night he goes what are you talking about i said i just walked past johnny in the hall he wouldn't even acknowledge me, wouldn't say hello, wouldn't wave, say nice job. He just kept walking. And Macaulay started to laugh. And he said, Johnny could walk past his mother in the hall and not say a little. First of all, he was a painfully socially awkward person outside anything with an audience. And second of all, he never wanted to attract attention to himself in the hall because we had tours all over the place. So if he stops and talks to me, he's going to have a gathering and he can't get to his office. And that made his head explode. He couldn't think about that. <laughs> so it was no problem. But that was a very hard 15 minutes until the guy made me feel better. <laughs> oh, about I have no doubt. I, Good grief. I thought I had tanked in show business. You know, we, we had several guests on who are in the Tonight Show all said that basically the same thing about Carson that, you know, did not like socializing outside of the being on stage. No, with he these. was a, a painfully shy guy. As yeah. a matter of fact, his head talent coordinator was a, a woman by the name of Shirley Woods, who moved out to L.A. when the Tonight Show was done in New York. She moved out to L.A., readjusted her whole life to you know, give her support to Johnny and was his talent coordinator for 30 years. And the day she retired, 
he wouldn't even come to her retirement party because oh, he's so, you know, you know, he's socially awkward. And plus, he, you know, he didn't want to, he, he didn't like to engage in emotional circumstances. So he, he avoided it altogether. Interesting mm -hmm. guy. If, you're, mm -hmm. if you want to read a great book about Carson, the book by his uh, former attorney, Henry Bushkin, is wonderful because he was his close friend and it talks about where all his neurosis came from. And that oh. was his relationship with his mom. His mom was like not to be pleased. She was a tough cookie. And, and Henry's feeling was that all of his awkwardness came from that relationship. Wow. I, I have a couple of Carson books. I don't have that one. I'm going to have to look for that one. It's now, really you, good. Yeah, you also involved, you know, you were thank you were involved with Will Ferrell's movie Anchorman. Now, how did that come yes. about? And what did you do exactly? Yes. I mean, what was that well, like? When they were writing the movie, Adam McKay and I went to the same high school, right? The guy that directed the movie was co wrote mm -hmm. it. And Judd Apatow and I had been friends because Judd was a host at the improv before he got famous and went to write on Gary Shandling's show, which is what made him mm -hmm. famous. He said, we're writing this movie about an anchor man. And uh, Ike, will, Ike will remember an anchor man from LA by the name of Paul Moyer. Do you remember oh, yeah. him? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I think these guys thought that his career might be a good template for Anchorman. <laughs> oh, so wow. they took me out to lunch. And uh, we had like a three hour lunch where I just told stories about Paul Moyer. <laughs> and at the end of the lunch, they said, this is fantastic. We could only use maybe snippets of it because people would not believe these stories. They would not <laughs> believe they were true if we translated them directly on the film, but we appreciate all your background. It was really a lot of fun. So they, I, I had one lunch with them and they gave me a thank you credit at the end of the first Anchorman movie. And it's one of my favorite movies of all time. It is one of Funny the most movie. hysterical movies I've ever seen. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. But I guess the truth of Anchorman was that it was based on this guy called John White or Jack White from San Diego. He was more of the out of control, egotistical, <laughs> narcissist kind of a character. And uh, Moyer, Moyer was crazy, but he wasn't that bad. I, I've never heard of an anchor man being so egotistical before. Well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do have to talk about one project you were involved with, which because I was such a huge, huge fan. And you appeared a few times on the show, you know, Who Wants to Be a Superhero by Stan, hosted by Stan Lee. Did you get to have much interaction with him off screen? And what was he like? I got to have no interaction with him off really? screen. Really? No, oh. uh, they just pre-recorded a segment there. And uh, oh. But, but, you know, I'll tell you, his fans were, he was a cult hero and uh, pretty crazy. Oh, well, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wish I had a better story. <laughs> well, we make something up. So you also yeah. had one of the last episodes of Perry Mason with Raymond Burr, another actor who's been in so many great films like Rear Window. Now, what was he like to work with? That's a really interesting story. Uh, it was an episode called Tale, uh, 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 The Tale of the Telltale Talk Show Host or something like that. Okay. Anyway, here's, yeah, the that story. Was... here's the story. They, they, NBC had bought the rights to the Perry Mason movies, so they thought they'd do some stunt casting. Hmm. So they got Fred Rogan, the sports guy, and I to play these morning, irritating morning DJs that worked for this imaginary radio station that was run by Regis Philbin. He was the general manager of the station. And so we were the morning DJs. Montel Williams had the sports radio show. Uh, Mariette Hartley was the women's issues show. And yeah. Christina Ferrari was the call in answer show. And if, if you know how Perry Mason episodes were everybody in the show is a suspect up until the last third of the show. So we were suspects because Regis gets bumped off about a third of the way through the show, right? Oh, and the sports show, or rather the uh, political show host was G. Gordon Liddy oh. of Watergate fame. When he yeah. was trying to resurrect his career and make any, you know, the union minimum job he could take. 
<laughs> and it, we actually got along great with him. He had a sense of humor and everything, but it was scary being with him. <laughs> uh, anyway, so all those guys were all uh, hosts at this imaginary radio station, and we were all suspected of having killed Regis Philbin. So it, it's a three-week shoot. It's in Denver because Viacom that owned Perry Mason shot up there. It was a non-union city, so they could do it for less expensive labor. And then it was time for us to do our interaction with, uh, with uh, Perry Mason, with, uh, you know, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, anyway, he had already had, uh, he had already been diagnosed with kidney cancer, which is what he ultimately died of. So they were sort of taking their time and wheeling him out during the day, they bring him in a wheelchair. He never worked with other actors. He played to a teleprompter. So mm -hmm. we would do our dialogue, looking off into the distance. And then he would come in and shoot his, but he would be reading his lines off of a teleprompter. Oh, but he was so skilled at that, that it looked, and when they cut it together, it looked like he was having a conversation with real humans. It was really a gift. He was, uh, I mean, that, that really took some acting chops. There was nobody else in the room and he did his part and they cut it all together later. So um, we never got to meet him, but it was a lot oh, of fun doing it. God, that's incredible. So who read, I mean, read his offstage lines? Not his off, but I mean. An AP, one of the associate producers. Just, oh my and gosh, that is. Play, and he'd have all the look of concern and and uh, it, it was really interesting. And I guess he'd done that even before he got sick because he was older. And yeah. uh, Ray Raymond Burr is like, you know, I'm old, so I'll think of it tomorrow and call him <laughs> back. But, uh, but uh, you know, he, but that's how he worked. He never worked with other actors for years. And so I, it was fascinating. We didn't know that until we got there. Right. Unbelievable. So what, uh, what made you decide to retire from the news when you did? Well, um, it was just time. Mm. You know, I, I got the job from the comedy store. I was a comic. Yeah. Uh, and in LA, like, as you know, the weather pattern is the same from April till October. Oh, it's yeah. Morning that's... clouds and fog, hazy afternoon sun, high in the low 70s. What was the question? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and my job, I was hired, you know, back in those days, the, the afternoon and evening newscasts were almost as friendly and family-like as you find on the morning newscast now where everybody has giggles and we all pretend we're having a great time and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and the, uh, it was a different time. And my job when I first started was just to be the palate cleanser between the tragedy and the sports. That was my, mm -hmm. make people feel better. I was the, mm -hmm. the only non-threatening part of the newscast. Well, now, with climate change, you'll notice that everybody that has a, a, a permanent weather job has in the lower right-hand corner that AMS seal, the American Meteorological Society. These are people that have a degree in atmospheric sciences or a degree in a weather forecasting. They, they know the science of it. I, I, was, not, I was a BS artist. I, 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 I just use personality. Now you have to know what you're talking about because weather is starting uh, people are starting to take weather more seriously and the weather has become a more competitive part of the newscast so it was a different time and yeah. i have grandchildren now i thought you know it's just time i i had a wonderful career and so i announced my retirement and then the shutdown happened the pandemic happened huh. my boss asked me to stay on for a couple of months just because they were going to do broadcasts from home and he wanted that to be a smooth transition. So I stayed on for a couple of months and that was it. And then I retired. So I've been mm. retired about a year and a half and I've, and I've never missed it for a day. Well, I was going to ask you that when, when you did notify them that you retired, did they, was there any like sort of push like, no, 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 don't go yet. You know, wait, wait. Did they, did they, no, they didn't to... say that they were gone. Fine. They were rid of this old guy. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> no, they, they, no, they, they understood. And it, it was time. I mean, it was, I think they were, I, I think they, it was a mutually agreed upon arrangement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was just time. Everybody was happy. They, I couldn't believe it. We're, we're you know, we're in the throes of COVID. They, they gave me a going away reception that lasted a day on television. I mean, the mayor of the city, uh, Karen Bass, who's running for 
uh, mayor of the city now was on there, Jay Leno, uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon, even Tom Brokaw, who has not been well from his ranch in Montana, did a little thing. It was breathtaking. It was uh, so lovely. Amazing. And uh, it was just time. It was so yeah. 40. I, I tell people, even if you love what you do, 40 years is long enough. <laughs> oh, I could agree more. It was about my time period before I said I'm it's it it's you know it's time for me to to rest. <laughs> what, what, did you, what did you do? I oh I was an actor. Um I started uh, my career as a child actor at nine years old. So um oh my God. I had a very long, very, very busy, successful run for uh for a long time. And and um yeah, and it seemed like my the overall arc was about like that 40 year mark. It's 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 time to uh yeah time to time to move on you survived and you're healthy you yes, know sir. <laughs> our, 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 and really i i mean that that sounds like a stretch but it's true we we we've had a bunch of uh uh, uh matured child actors uh, for instance christopher knight who was on the brady's was one of our yeah. last guests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we had tony dow on bless his heart before he passed away and on the same show with tony we had bill mooney and you might even know those guys from work earlier in your career yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, I mean, I've, I've met Billy, um, not, not worked with, um, I've worked with more of my contemporaries. Those guys were uh, a bit older and started working yeah. at an earlier time, not an earlier age, but an earlier time right. than yeah. I did. But yeah, we're, I, I feel like we're a small, you know, a small group, yeah, especially I, from the sixties and seventies. Um, and, and it, you know, uh, a lot of them didn't uh, didn't fare so well, you know. A lot no, of us did not no. fare so well. So I feel very fortunate. No, um, no. but and, and a great surprise is, for instance, we had Christopher Knight on like a month ago, and yeah. you know, you 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 when you don't when you only know their acting career, you don't know that there's depth to this person. And yeah. the revelation is to talk to somebody. Christopher Knight is a computer genius and technical. He can talk about anything. It was such a cool thing and a revelation to talk to these guys that you knew, you know, were part of our growing up, but there's, a, you know, he's a three-dimensional human being. I don't know why that's surprising, but it, 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 it was, so. Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's always, always interesting because we have, you know, sort of mythic or romanticized ideas about who any personality is so it's always lovely to get to to talk to all of you guys and and you know learn more about you so now you're yeah. talking about your podcast media path tell us tell us more about the show and how it came about okay well my partner louise palanker we call her wheezy uh, <laughs> is a, is a is a great american success story this woman was one of the creators of premier radio networks which started as a radio service, uh, you know, 25 years ago. She was a joke writer for Rick Dees. And then she and a couple of our other fellow writers had the great idea to, why don't we write jokes for small and medium market DJs that can't afford their own writers and every day we'll fax them some current events jokes and they can subscribe to us and they can make it sound like, you know, this is right off the top of their head. They call it the plain rap comedy service. And the next thing you know, they had like 500 radio stations on their subscription list. Wow. And then they expanded their services to where she would go to premieres and these things that you're aware of when you go inter interview people who are, um, I forget what they call them, press junkets. And yeah. she would interview stars, cut them up, send all these interviews to these radio stations so that the radio DJs could sort of interact with this pre-cut video and make it sound like they're wow. talking to Robin Williams instead of you. So they created a, uh, they created a, uh, an industry called a Premier Radio Networks. About 12 years ago, they sold that company to Clear Channel Radio and the rest is history. And oh then she became, a doc she became a documentary filmmaker. She made a great uh, documentary about the Calsill family uh, called Calsill's A Family Band, which aired on Showtime for two years and now is still streaming on uh, Amazon Prime. So it's a great documentary about an interesting family, not unlike the Jacksons, where we have the squeaky clean image of this family, but the darkness is way deep. And it's it was really fascinating. So anyway, she's been my friend for years. She produced two of my one-person shows. We've always been friends. We've always had 
uh, similar interest in books and movies and discussions. And so when I retired and I was no longer under contract at NBC, I, I wasn't able to do a podcast before that. She invited me to come and be her co-host and she'd done three or four podcasts. So she knew what she was doing. She has a beautiful podcasting studio in her home and we did it and we've done almost two years and we're up to about a hundred episodes and I'm just loving it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I love to have conversations about stuff. I don't know anything about, which is fun. So <clears throat> Well, that's how I, you know you two i mean you have a great rapport together so and you mentioned how you work together i, I find the, the structure of the show very entertaining uh you both start talking about current events of the day or, or what tv show or that you're both watching or something like that <laughs> and then you bring on your guests and you also discuss the current event with your guests with it so that was that always going to be the format or that evolved into into that somehow well that's kind of what we did you know our, our common interests are you know books and movies and stuff you know pop culture like you guys right so i thought okay well, well here's what we'll do we'll start the show that's why we call it media path we start the show with suggestions on something we saw over the last week for instance we did we did one yesterday i saw a great movie about native american influence in rock and roll called rumble i don't know if you saw that rumble was the name of a song by a guitarist by the name of link ray who was part native american and he's the guy that invented fuzz tone and the twang guitar and mm -hmm. rumble was the name of his first hit record. So there's a whole documentary about guys concluding with Jimi Hendrix, who was part Cherokee Indian. So they go through the whole history. So I say, oh, that was a cool movie. I talk about that for five minutes. Then she talks about a book she read and we take up the first 10, 12 minutes of the show doing that. And then we introduce a guest. The guest we had yesterday was Lori Jacobson that wrote a book called The Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium in 1965, which was mm. really a fascinating book about just that one concert. And it was the first time they'd ever done a concert in a stadium before and all the seismic shift that took place with that. So interesting. Anyway, that you know, it's us just continuing a conversation that we have in our regular lives about stuff we both find fascinating. Huh. Hmm. So, so what else, what shows are you watching now? Just out of curiosity. Oh man, there's so much streaming content. <laughs> Which is I'll true. I, I always love. like recommendations. So <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I love. And, and, and my, I, I might be a little older than some of you guys. And so this won't hold the fascination it did for me, but I saw Gaslit with Julia Roberts, which hmm. was the, um, uh, the uh, John Mitchell was one of the people indicted in the Watergate scandal, and his wife, uh, Margaret Mitchell, was uh, a woman who was being accused of having leaked secrets about this to the press. And it was a long series, and and um, uh, the her, John Mitchell, the actual character, was played by. No, I'm not going to be able to remember. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, oh, Sean Penn. And I got to tell you, oh. when you see the makeup job on Sean Penn, it's mind blowing. Anyway, I like that. I like the movie called uh, Dropout, which was about Theranos, this woman that faked this company from Silicon Valley yes. and had like $4 billion before the whole thing fell out. So mm -hmm. I love those things. I love things that are based on fact, you mm -hmm. know? So it's kind of fun. Mm. And, and the same token, we want to hear your, your book. What, what are you reading now? So. Okay, the book I just finished, is I like history. So I, I read a book called 1861, which was a, a book about the first, uh, it's called from Adam Goodhart. It's a book about the first year of the Civil War. Uh, and But what makes the book resonate is that all of the feelings in the country during that period, the uh, political divide, the extreme racism, the uh, geographic differences, the unsettled nature of people's relationships, even within their own family, was almost exactly like what we're experiencing right now. All that to say, for people who are worried about whether we're going to be able to come out of this current malaise, <laughs> uh, we've been there before, we will survive, just keep your head up and press forward. But it's a mm. fascinating book, and I like history, so. 
I, I always find that fascinating. You know, you go, people saying like, there's never been a more bitter time in politics. And then you go back and look at like, you know, like the revolutionary period or the after. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> I talked about that yesterday. Thomas Jefferson hired a guy to write right. a book about John Adams and completely trashed the guy. They, they were much <laughs> more cool back then because they had no laws of, you know, why right, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. Your guess, your guess have been such an eclectic group. I mean, has that been a concerted effort to like try to vary it up? Like, oh, we want a musician now, or, or an actor this week, or an author. Do you think about that aspect, or just, or just whoever you find interesting? Yeah, I, I mean, really, and, and you know, we've only been in existence for about a year and a half, so you know how it is. Yeah, yeah beggars can't be choosers. If we have people that have. <laughs> If we have people that have a book for sale, I, I love politics and we've had some great authors. We had Adam Schiff come on and uh, uh, talk about his book. We had Ira Shapiro that wrote a book about Mitch McConnell, which is fascinating. Uh, we, we've had a Michael Isakoff that wrote one of the first books about uh, Trump malfeasance. And uh, so we have that. We, we, we talk about politics. We love movies. We've had Henry Winkler on. We've had... Um, uh, lots of people. We just love people. For, you know, it, it's like pop culture. Whoever is part of the current zeitgeist, we like to talk to those people. Mm. Do you find your guests eager to appear? Yes. I, I'll tell you when they, when you win them over. When <laughs> you have somebody on there and they understand that you have read their book uh, because yeah. that, that's the minority. They're so thankful that they can, you know, drill down on the topics they talk about in the book because you've read the book and you have an opinion about it and they love that and you immediately earn their respect and they immediately open up to you. Hmm. And it's not the typical questions you would ask, you know, in a press briefing or something. Well, I'm yeah. curious because I, I looked at your thing and I watched several of your episodes and, you know, we've had some of the same guests on. Now, I have to know any, any who've turned you down because... I, we've had actually some who were like nasty about turning us down. So. <laughs> oh yeah, well you know how it is. Uh, the the public relations people that book these things right. want to do the work, and so what they do is they they find podcasts where I have the greatest social media following. <laughs> well, we're just working on that now. We have a little bit of a social media following, but it's not huge. But we're getting there. We have a publicist who's helping us do it, and so. You know, the, the, the big authors, you know, want to sort of cherry pick where they put their mm -hmm. clients. And so we, yeah, we've been turned down, but not in a cruel way. Like we never want to see you because you suck. I, I've, you know. I've, I've had one that's turned us down in a cool way. Like you flat out said, you're not big enough. <laughs> so no, I, I, I'm sure they, you know what? That, and that's probably the harsh reality of it. They've never said yeah. that to our face, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's what happens. And you know what I mean? There are 150,000 podcasts. And so, right, right. Well, you know, on that same token, has there ever, because we, we've had, has there ever been like a guest that, like, after a few minutes that you've thought, like, oh, this is not going the way I thought it was going to go? Um, there, there are, you know, you get exhausted from trying to fill in for short answer guests. <laughs> yes. But, but yes. Um, there's never been one where, uh, ooh, this is getting ugly and we're gone. As a matter of fact, if it's a little more of a challenge in a conversation, sometimes it's fun, you know, because it, there's no law that says it has to be an hour podcast. We no, can say, well, so. thanks for playing. <laughs> You know, we'll uh, we'll hang up on you and then talk about newspapers and stuff. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's it's uh, I, I've, we've never never had one of those. I'm, I I I guess I have to expect it as a podcasting host. You guys have probably been doing it well, longer than well, I have. I think we've done the same amount of time as you. So uh, we, we could share notes when we're off the off the air. <laughs> <laughs> When we're not recording. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, you, we show our age every time we say on the air or off the air. It just cracks me oh, up. Oh, I know there's no air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, have, can, can you name a, a favorite guest or do you have a favorite guest you've had on? I think Henry Wengler is our favorite guest. We've had him on oh, twice. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you came across him, Mike, in your career, but he is truly... I, you know what I love, and, and this is a rare encounter in Hollywood, when you meet someone who is extremely talented, but they're very comfortable in their own skin, and oh, they yeah. don't 
They don't have to talk down to you. They immediately embrace you. They're interested in you and your family and what you bring to the table. And it's such a relief. Henry, uh, Weezy and I uh, co-produced a show with Henry and we got a pilot on Comedy Central. It was called The Couch. And this was, uh, we had three comedians sitting on a couch and then a couple would come in and they would have problems. And the comedians in their fabulous way would give them um, suggestions on how they might solve this domestic issue. Some of them were constructive, some of them were condescending, but it was funny. And Henry loved it. He wanted to executive produce it. So we, we created this pilot. We did it at NBC when I was still working there. And we took this thing around and sold it to Comedy Central and they gave us oh. our own pilot. It was never picked up because the vice president of development was fired like the day after we did the pilot. Anyway, that's the way it works. You know this, like that's the way. Oh yeah. Oh my God, I've but, had too many friends that that yeah, happened to. Yeah. 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 But right. <laughs> the fun was. I mean, this is the funs. The fun yeah. was to walk around and go to meetings at ICM, or Levity or something, and watch the world react to Henry Winkler, and the seas <laughs> would part. But he would take as much time as was possible. Uh, to, to, you know, address everybody's questions, look them in the eye, be very warm. And I really learned a lot about the power of stardom and the responsibility of being a star. And I, he was, he was the best. He, he was the one. I'll tell you one of the most surprising guests I've ever had on was John Bauman, who was Bowser from Sha Na Na. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know some of his political activity, but he uh, got some legislation passed in Congress to protect old singers and songwriters. For instance, the coasters, um, there are about five manifestations of the bands, the coasters going mm -hmm. on. Some of them have none of the original artists. And so the original artist writes to the songs and the performance are not protected. So John ba Bowser, uh, Bauman got Congress and really forwarded a piece of legislation that was passed. And then we had him on to talk about this. He is so smart and so politically astute. He graduated from Columbia University. And here's a guy that does doo-wop music. That, that's where I knew him from. Mm -hmm. he, he was, I said, you should run for Congress. He was so interesting. So he was my biggest surprise. Henry was uh, the warmest guest we ever had. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, you, you, I just want to know, first of all, like who's high on the wish list? Anyone who's high on the wish list to, to come up in the upcoming episodes? Oh, man. I don't think so. We don't do that to ourselves so that we can be grossly disappointed. <laughs> We're just, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who we have coming up in a couple of weeks. That I am so stoked. I can't believe it is Felix Cavalieri from the Rascals. Uh, I am, I'm a huge, I'm born and raised in Philadelphia. I'm a blue eyed soul guy, rhythm and blues kid. And I am so looking forward. His music meant so much to me as a child. We, so we, I am. So, we had him on several months ago. He was, he was great. Oh my God. Was he, tell, was it okay? Tell me, I hope it was good. No, he oh, was you're gonna, so you, great. He, he was, yeah, you're, you'll have a great time. He was a great storyteller and uh, gracious. Yeah, very gracious. yeah, very, very gracious. Absolutely. You'll enjoy good. it. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. And I love the music as well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan a, of that. A girl like you in Beautiful Morning are like two oh, of my favorites. On, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I just, you know, you've done, you've mentioned you've done like 100 shows. Has this been like a way that has it been fulfilling on your creative side after leaving the news and everything? Yes, I'll tell you, I, I, I do the podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm also on the board of directors of three nonprofit organizations. Oh, wow. And now that COVID's winding up, you know, we're doing more activity there. I, my life is full of things that give me great joy. I haven't mm -hmm. missed my weather job. I'm very thankful for my career. I'm mm -hmm. the luckiest guy in show business next to Pat Sajak. But I, uh, <laughs> but I, I have not. I have not missed my weather job for one nanosecond because my life is full. I get to see my children and my grandchildren. And when you're doing the news, that 11 o'clock news, I've often said, is the greatest speed bump to a social life ever invented. 
So I missed a lot of my children's growing up and now I get to do that with my grandchildren. It's everything is good. Well, you say you don't, you don't, you say you don't miss the news. So we would ask that, but not, not, but not no. And the world is so dark now. It's just like you're pumping all this depressing information into people's lives. I don't, I don't miss it. Well, do mm -hmm. you have any projects yourself coming up for your individually? Well, I have a new stand-up show that we're going to tape on October sixteenth oh, at the yeah. El Portal Theater in North Hollywood. Uh, we're going to uh, try to market this on a streaming platform. Our director has some experience with doing that. And so we're going to take a new hour special. Maybe you guys will be able to stream it in your homes. I would love that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's and what does the future hold for Media Path? Well, we're just going to try to go forward and grow. As you know, growing your social media presence is very important. Sure. Mm -hmm. Trying to get a little bit of a reputation, trying to get more public relations and marketing people to trust us as a good venue for their clients. And, you know, that's a slow process. But I learned this back at the beginning of this, and you might have learned it in the same time period I did. You can't look at how many people are listening to your thing or how wide your audience is. You have to put that out of your mind and just do it for the joy of doing it. And if it's quality, if, 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 if the joy you uh, have and it shows, people will come to you and you just have to let that happen. You know, I mean, it's not like the news where you, you obsess over the overnight ratings every night. Oh, my God, we had three fewer people tonight than we did last night. What are we going to do? You can't look at it that way. You just have to let it grow. You know, you're 100 percent right, because we, we talk about that a lot. It's, you know, we only ask people on that we enjoy. We are like we're fans of or we like we, we think would make fascinating guests. So we do it for kind of like for us. <laughs> no, that, that, and that's, the, that's, yeah. why, that's why it will always have quality, because your natural inquisitiveness about whoever you're talking to will make people like it. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, how often do fans reach out to you? Well, we're starting to get some activity on our Facebook page now, and they're, mm. they're, they're reaching out. We're, uh, you know, we're getting some good notification. It's a slow process. Yeah, I stay yeah. out of that. We have a producer that looks at that and she finds out where we're strong. Hey, we're, <laughs> we're trending in Norway. So mention Norway, you know, all the, <laughs> I, I just, I just do it. I, really, I learned not to obsess over that stuff in the news, because if you obsess over uh, demographics and psychographics and ratings, your head will explode. It's just, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a dark tunnel that I don't like to go down. So I just do it. And I hope people like it. <laughs> Are you going to be in any conventions or, con you know, at all like that for yourself or to, with fans? Uh, not not uh, too much uh, at the moment. I have a lot, you know, now that COVID is over, mm -hmm. uh, that COVID is winding down, um, we're, uh, we're starting to get more uh, comedy bookings. So I'm doing one or oh, two great. dates a week. That makes me very happy. So oh, everything is opening up. Huh? My life is full of what I want it to be full of. So, oh, I, I hope I hope you make it out to South Florida. To do it, to oh, do listen, so man, there's, there's a chance I will. Oh, all, I of hope so. all of my remaining relatives live in the Vero Beach area, so I fly into Orlando. I rent a car, drive two hours south, and there I am. Well, by all means, let us know if <laughs> you're going to be in this area. <laughs> now, where where can people speaking of media path and you talking about you're growing your platform where can people follow media path on social media okay we have we have a, a fan page where you can learn all about all that at mediapathpodcast.com it has our whole um market of uh, past episodes there we have a facebook page media path podcast with fritz and wheezy and you can get on the fan page there Lots, lots of fun stuff coming up. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about it, fellas. I appreciate it. No, Fritz, thank you so much for joining us today. We are, we are big fans, and this has been very entertaining, and we love your podcast. Right. And thank again, you so thank you. Much. It was a pleasure. Keep up the good work, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And again, a special thanks to Fritz Coleman. And please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.